Before I ask him the question, how many of you have bought something from Fab India? Okay, maybe that's a wrong question. How many of you have never bought anything from Fab India? Like three, four, five. Well, okay. I need to convert about five people in this yes, room. Yes, you do. You do. <laughs> you know, so, but uh, William, I'm very excited to be talking to you because. Uh, I keep on saying, but let me tell you that when I was in Stephens in Delhi, uh, uh, and, and the money was very limited, uh, which it's still it's limited as an entrepreneur. But that time it was very limited, so we used to go to GK and Fab India used to be like the place to shop, and it continues to be that place because it has defined for so many of us our journey uh, of fabric, of wearing, of style, of. Uh, who we are in many ways. You know, if you have to make a statement, then it is Fab India. And we are so honored and delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, one question which keeps coming to my mind is that for so many years, being so extremely relevant, how do you do that as a brand? Um, Shada, I think that it's a um, quite daunting experience to be here. I saw, I met some of the people here and some of the amazing brands that are being created by the people in this room. The only thing I'll, I'll say that we've had to do constantly is look at how we can reinvent, reinvent ourselves. And uh, the consumer market is changing faster and faster. So um, we've had many instances every few years where we've had to take a really hard look and reinvent ourselves. I'll give you one example. Um, when the e-commerce boom came, our investors said, you need to be an e-commerce company. Old retail is dead, you need to be an e-commerce company. I said to them, look, old retail is dead, but it doesn't mean there's just one direction to go in, which is to be an e-commerce company, because I said, we neither have the deep pockets, nor do I like to lose the kind of money that e-commerce companies are losing, and they've lost a lot more since then. I said, let's look for an alternate model. And my idea was that, look, consumers are gonna eventually like two things. They're gonna want brutal efficiency. They're gonna like to sit in their pajamas at home watching a movie, and ordering something from an e-commerce platform. So that's brutal efficiency. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is they're gonna crave, crave some kind of what I call H2H, -H, human to human contact. And I said, we need to master that space because we can't master this space. So what I did was I very clearly with our team, we had a lot of discussions and we decided that we were gonna become not only India's favorite brand, but also India's favorite experience. So we then, started two years ago, shifting the whole business into a completely experiential business, into a customized business. In fact, what we've been able to do on our e-commerce platform is customize everything so that earlier we used to have our select customers where we kept their measurements and made them customize products. Now we can do that for every one of our customers. So we have chosen a path. When the market is zigging, we've chosen to zag. And the reason we've done that is because I, I looked at any of our core competencies, and none of our core competencies lent themselves to being an e-commerce company. So I said, there's tremendous, our investors and others were, and the market was putting tremendous pressure. They said, you have to be e-commerce or die, was one of, what one of the guys said to me. He came into the office and said, e-commerce or die. Do you want to be dead or do you want to be an e-commerce company? I said, neither. We neither want to be dead nor do we want to be an e-commerce company. Wow, that's, uh, uh, that's strange to, to your conviction. So, uh, William, you know, you say that what we hear you say on and off is that you're an accidental entrepreneur. What does that mean? You know, uh, when I hear your stories of all your entrepreneurs, and I love reading about those stories that Shraddha and her team write about, I realize my story is very similar to your story, which is that I came into entrepreneurship quite by accident. I wanted to be an environmental journalist, and I was doing, moving in that direction, and um, my father fell ill, and I had a choice, and I had to either continue what I was doing or get involved with the business. At that point, we were an exp ex export business, and I had no interest in being in an export business, and we had no brand name. We would sell under other people's brands. So the only revelation I had was that I was traveling through India, and I would see people talk about wanting to have a brand that represented India. And I could see that at that point, every brand was a Me Too brand. So somebody would say, oh, that brand's like The Gap, that brand's like so-and-so, that brand's copying this British brand. So I said, how do we create a truly Indian brand, a truly Indian brand that spoke to you know, heritage, that revived certain traditions and all. And fortunately, we were already doing that in our export business. So I was able to transfer that into retail. 
And it was a really rough start, I must say. Our first projects were all failures. So we learned from those and we were patient and, and what you see today is, is a result of overcoming those failures. You know, but uh, again, let's talk about the relevance because to me, Fab India, if if one has to do a brand study, Fab India is definitely one of the most favorite Indian uh, brands. In fact, whenever, I don't know if some of you do that, but when I am traveling uh, anywhere across the world, I uh, take gifts from Fab India because that represents what is so uniquely Indian. Two things, William, I want to ask you is that Fab India has remained so relevant as a brand, right? Like it has not, like I started using when I was 18 to now, like I'll not go on my, to my age, but you know, forever. 23. Yes. 23. <laughs> yeah, but it has, you know, you, you, it's still so relevant. How do you continue? What did you do uh, to make this? Because you said that you didn't have, when you became an entrepreneur, it was not a brand. So how do you go about building something like that? And second thing, tell us about your journey because you've got a lot of investors, uh, different kinds of investors. Uh, how do you sell to new age investors uh, a company which is not e-commerce? Wow, that's quite a question. So let me start with how a brand stays relevant. I mean, I, one of the things that I get is a lot of information from people I talk to. So I think the one thing you, my only piece of advice I can really give you is keep a curious mind, keep an open curious mind. Recently, I took an overnight train journey on a, on a local train and I ended up talking to all the passengers in the compartment and I got so much information from them on what they were thinking, what they were thinking for their children, what their children were thinking, you know, and that's really important. And you know, one of the things that I really came across there from that experience is that everybody had wellness on their mind. So we began to really focus one part of Fab India is called a company called Organic India. Yeah. We began to focus on the wellness space. And it has just exploded for us. And the information came just from talking to people and seeing everybody was talking, 40-year-old men were talking about how unwell they felt and how they were. And then, you know, I realized that people were eating junk food. They were eating fairly toxic food. They had some lifestyle habits that were. And I suddenly thought to myself, wow, this, what we really need to do is focus on wellness. So each of these ideas, I don't think I can take credit for having claimed any ideas my own. The ideas come to you from the ecosystem. You just have to be curious and listen. If, you don't, if you're not curious, you don't listen, you're shutting yourself off to the potential or the future of whatever you do. Yeah, and, and, and tell us about the, the investors because you've raised uh, uh, money from external investors. So tell us how do you do that and uh, how do you tell a story because we are at tech sparks, we are at a tech event and if I may say so, you are a non-tech entrepreneur. Yeah, I don't know how I made it here, but anyway. <laughs> um, the thing about investors is you have to remember it is a marriage. You go into an investment with the same probably thought process you have when you're entering a marriage, especially if they're going to be investors who are sitting on your board and all. You, and, I, and I see a lot of young entrepreneurs, especially my friends in tech, they just look for the highest valuation and they say, okay, let's marry these people. I'm like, this is not the way to do it because you're going to end up with a guy sitting on your board and if his long-term interests and yours are not in alignment, they will be constant friction. So what I would say is really look for a fit, look for an alignment of values, look for an interest in if they respect what you do and what you bring. Because the thing is that in every investment journey, there are good days and bad days. And I have seen bad investors get really mad when things don't go the way they're planning to go. So having, I spend a lot of time thinking about who to get as investors, when to exit investors, and it's really important that you have good marriages. We've had five good marriages, uh, no divorces, and I'm really pleased about that. We've, there's some amazing investors out there, there are also some terrible investors out there. And um, I've seen friends who've had terrible investors, and it's, it's something you should be really careful of. The last thing you want to do is go for the highest valuation. You need to look at what kind of terms they're asking for, because the devil lies in the details, and you need to spend a lot of time with them before the marriage. Go on lots of dates with your investors. Do you know, one question that uh, comes to mind with Fab India is that the phenomenal scale that Fab India has had in this country, like you go to any corner and there is a Fab India uh, store. So you've 
created tremendous scale, but at the same time, it feels personal. It feels uh, customized. It feels that it is the product is talking to me. How do you do that? How do you do that at scale? The, the thing that is hard for entrepreneurs, and it's something I've had to train myself and teach myself in, is that entrepreneurs uh, have a particular type of energy. We have the kind of get up and go energy, seize the opportunity, seize the moment, seize the day. That's the energy we have. The energy that builds large-scale companies is an institutional energy and the energy to run the franchise. And I think that as entrepreneurs, I think one of the most common mistakes we make is we don't respect the other energy enough. There's an amazing book I read recently. I would recommend it to everybody in this room. It's called Loon Shots by Safi Bakal. It will change your life. And he talks about how you respect the franchise energy as an entrepreneur. Because the energy that builds the institution is very different from the energy that creates new ideas. And I think it's important to respect that other energy, to, to, in, to invest in that energy, to invest in the people who are absolutely opposite to an entrepreneur in terms of character, but they're the institution builders and give them their space. Because if you don't, you will end up being a really energetic person who runs around, does everything themselves, and actually doesn't grow beyond a certain point. So you've done that, and, 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 and that's what you think has got, got that kind of a scale? Do you have a professional management team? See, entrepreneurship is all about inspiration, running with an idea, having you know, the chutzpah, the interest, the curiosity, all that. The franchise energy is all about the ratios, the proportions, making sure that the stores open on time, the light fittings are in the right place, the shelves are done properly, the computer systems are working, the, you know, it's a, about hundreds and hundreds of checklists and just about rolling things out in incremental improvements all the time. That's what I call the franchise energy. That energy, if married to the entrepreneur's energy, can produce something yeah. quite amazing. Okay, okay. Uh, William, uh, for us, when we see your Fab India, we only see success, greatness, great stores, everything amazing. But you, have, you said that there have been a lot of failures. Uh, tell us about some of the failures so that we can feel good about ourselves also. <laughs> <laughs> How many failures do you want to know about? As a, many. There's a long list, so I can start at the top. Um, okay, one big failure is, because I never went to business school, I, I basically have, I barely got a BA degree. I mean, that's also just by sheer luck I got a BA degree. So I was always in awe of these MBA types who would come and give you advice. They said, you know, strategically you should do this, and tactically you should do this, and if you uh -huh. marry strategy and tact, whatever. So once upon a time, we had a lot of, people who came, you know, said you should, as an Indian company, you should acquire a foreign brand, especially a British brand, because, you know, it'll be like recolonizing England. So, <laughs> so, anyway, I was in awe of all these really smart people who'd been to IIMs and, you know, wonderful places like that, who all had it all worked out, and they were like, if you do this, you will have a force multiplier, you will go from 1x to 10x, all this <laughs> stuff. So we ended up buying a UK brand. The biggest mistake I made in my life because the next 10 years, I spent digging myself out of a hole I had jumped into. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, I might not have an MBA and I might not have, you know, attended lots of, you know, fancy companies and learned all this uh, speak, uh, consulting speak. But, you know, I did have a kind of uh, Dukandar's attitude to, you know, how to run business. And I had a kind of, what I deeply respect is Dukandar's buddhi. Do you understand him? Yes, from yes. The North, so you should. So, I found that I shouldn't be in awe of those people because I was in awe of all those people and we literally, that was a big mistake. Now, there were about 13 or 14 other mistakes, but I won't <laughs> You know, but then uh, thanks for sharing this honestly because we, I think we all um, go through, we have all gone through and we all go through this experience as an entrepreneur. You know, you're talking about all these MBA kinds, but now let me tell, uh, uh, share with, I think most of you would know that uh, Fab India is a case study in Harvard Business School and it is taught in Harvard Business School. So tell us about that. You know, I think one of the most interesting days of my life was when we were invited to, the case, their case was being taught and they said, can you come in and just be there and the students will ask questions. So we, I walked into the first classroom and about one third of the class stood up and started cheering. And then I looked up and that was a one third of the class that was from India and they were all cheering and that was a great moment. Yeah, 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 congratulations. We feel very, very uh, uh, proud and we feel very proud of uh, uh, Fab India. Uh, also, 
did you from day one think about, you know, because you have such a strong linkage with all the craftspeople, so there is a social element to Fab India, though we also bitch, by the way, and I'm also one of the bitchers who says, Fab India is very expensive. But, uh, um, but do you, uh, you know, this thought of empowering crafts artisans, was it there from day one, and, and how, do you, how did you go about building this? So, um, uh, my father was an American who came to India in 1958 and fell in love with the country and joined, uh, was working in the Central Cottage Industries Corporation, which was um, a very Gandhian institution in those days, and he really loved what he saw. So when I was a kid, I grew up traveling around the country and visiting, you know, s villages and seeing how product products are made and seeing the variety and the, the diversity in the country. So I think my early training was really at that point. I missed a lot of school. I did, did that and it gave me an idea of what kind of products were available, what kind of traditions, what kind of, you know, I mean, I first experienced Ayurveda there, I first experienced so many different techniques, so many different skills, so many different heritage. Um, and so when you get exposed to that much, as you grow up, you carry that inside you. So I think that helped me, it gave me an encyclopedia of understanding what was produced, how it was produced, where it came from and did that, because I'm not traditionally from a business family. Yeah. Like, my father entered business quite by accident. My mother's side of the family, who are from India, have all been in service, all in government, all, actually, most of my mother's family were in the military, so they, nobody, you know. When I, I remember going to my uncle, who was in the army, actually, he was a wonderful man, uh, for advice. He had, uh, he used to be chairman of the company in those days, and I said, can you give me some business advice? He said, I can give you advice on how to shoot a gun, but <laughs> I can't give you much business advice. So I realized that, you know, you, you just, uh, a lot of people in business at the time were actually from business families, and they had a lot of networks to draw from, for money, for what, advice, all that. So what I did was I formed my own council of people. And I would say that this is something that's really important for people to do, because you form your own council of advisors, of people, and I gave them all equity in the company, because I felt if they were gonna give me good advice, I should give them equity in the company. And that's, I think, one really positive thing we did. Yeah. Uh, uh, William, if you have to look back at your own journey so far, and, 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 and rightfully you don't come from an entrepreneurial, uh, you know, as in family of business people, and to me you are a self-made person, you got into uh, uh, building the Fab India brand. What are some of the things that you think now have worked for you? Because one thing which I think about you is that you are a very good uh, observer and even at your stage where you can be quite arrogant and uh, all that you are not and you listen to people because I also had a suggestion and you listen to people but what are some of the things that have held you in good stead which we could all look at imbibing? I think it's, it's um, very important that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs I meet when I ask them what their strategy is they said you know a lot like recently I was having an interesting meeting I said what's your strategy he said you know our strategy is to raise us early stage, then series A, then I said, that's not a strategy. I mean, that is your investment plan. And then they were like, we'll, I said, what, what are you passionate about? What do you really care about? What, what, what excites you? What, and they were like, what excited them was the whole process of raising multiple rounds of money. <laughs> now, that's not a business. I mean, that is, that's something that's a byproduct. And I think for me, it's always connecting with the passion of what you like and what you believe in. And I think if you can plug your s wire into that socket of life, then I think you really get a lot of charge. You're always excited, like what you're doing. I thought you'd have a teleprompter here, how you can remember everybody's details, but you're passionate about it. So your passion comes through. So the same way that I think if you, if you can't find your socket, then think about what you're doing. You know, walk around with your plug point and look, look for what, where you can plug it in, which gives you the charge. Because don't do it just for the fact that there's easy investment money out there and you have an idea that you can scale up. But really be passionate about the idea because that's what's going to differentiate you and make the business survive and thrive in the long term. You know, uh, for all of us here, you know, in India we always say, oh, uh, you know, we, we are very good in engineering and, and I'm talking like we are very good in engineering, we are very good in this, 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 but we are not very good in design and we are not very good at building brand, but you have built a brand and if you had to tell us one or two things that we should do to build a brand, what would that be? 
any kind of brand, I mean, from a tech brand to a food brand, to whatever you're building, you have to know who you are and who you're not. I saw an amazing two brands in Bangalore recently. One was called Go Native and the other one was called Purple Turtle. Mm. These are amazing brands. And the reason they're amazing brands is that the people who run them know who they're not. So they're good editors. They're not trying to do everything. They're not trying to be a restaurant that serves Italian food and Mughalai food and Chinese and Mongolian. You really have to cut. I see a lot of tech guys saying, we'll do this and we'll stick our fingers here, 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 and they end up really lost. Yeah. And I think the important thing is to really just chisel and fine tune and know who you are, concentrate on that, focus on your, where you're broadcasting in whatever you do. I mean, I, I use the example of Go Native because they're reviving traditional foods in the South, you know, yeah. foods that people had forgotten how to make, and they're doing it with a modern twist. So that's their USP, and they're sticking absolutely clearly to that USP. So that, that's the kind of thing I think is really important to do. Yeah. And say no all the time. Say no to lots of things, because if you say no to a lot of things, then when the yes thing moment comes, you have the time and energy to focus on it. Yeah. Uh, William, uh, I don't know if everyone knows here, but you are also an investor. You invest in startups and, uh, and you are in a place, a room filled with startups. <laughs> Most of them would also be looking at raising money. So tell us what, what are the companies that you invest in and, uh, uh, and how can people pitch to you? How honest do you want me to be? Do you, I want you to be extremely honest. You, I want you to be you. Yeah. Um, firstly, I think the <clears throat> the days when it was raining, uh, what I call idiot money, it was raining idiot money, those days are fortunately coming to an end, and I, my apologies for any investors in this room, but there was a lot of idiot money that rained down on investors where guys would literally, I mean, the guy has, an entrepreneur came to see me, and he says, you know, I want to open 200 of these consumer-facing businesses, the business you'll have heard of, so I'm not going to talk about it. I said, you know what, let's look at your unit economics. He said, yeah, my unit economics will be fine when I open 200. In fact, they'll be great when I open 1,000, <laughs> fine when I open 200. I said, but this particular unit that you have is losing money. He said, yes, but not a problem, because I'll get the investor money, and then I'll do 200, and then I'll be profitable. I was like, great, but if you multiply a loss-making unit 200 times, I mean, I said, yeah. he's like that, you know, boss, that is so 20th century thinking. I was like, wow. And at that time, the crazy thing, Shraddha, is that there was money f chasing this guy. Yeah. Because yeah. 20th century thinking, gravity, everything didn't exist. For a while, we were all floating in this space. That has changed. So, you know, you have to go back to the fundamentals of what you're doing. You know, path to revenue, path to profit, all the boring things. Path to revenue, path to profitability. You know, there was one guy who had a tech business who said, you know, I've got like gazillion eyeballs. I said, where's the revenue? He said, you know, the revenue will appear when this, 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 and this happens. So in those days, these kind of interesting ideas were being funded. No offense to your investors, but there was money pouring from everywhere. That money has stopped, and I think it's, it's good that it stopped, because it's brought a sense of reality back to an, a very unrealistic situation. And I think the investors now who are cutting checks are doing so with a lot of thought. They're looking at the unit economics, boring. They're looking at path to revenue. They're looking at path to profitability. They're looking at the management team's ability to scale all these concepts that earlier went out the window. So I'm glad the 20th century is back. <laughs> Let's see what happens. So, so from your answer, should I read that you will invest in companies which are looking at all these things? Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you are going on record to say yes, that anyone who's thinking like this and building like this, you will be open to talking to them. Maybe. <laughs> okay, no. One other point. Respect, love your investors. They're people who believed in your business idea and they backed it with money. It's very easy to say your idea is fantastic, man, I'll, I'm really, but they backed it with money. They backed it and there are too many entrepreneurs I see who don't treat their investors well. In fact, I was with an entrepreneur yesterday who really hasn't treated his investors particularly well and I, and I think that's really sad because these are people who stood by you in the early days they really worked for you, they, 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 they voted with their money, which is the best way to vote. So really look after them, make them, really make them feel good, because I'll tell you something, when we exited our first investor, it was a small investor who exited. The four guys who worked in that firm went to work in 
four other firms and then moved to another firm. But they all carried the success of the Fabinia investment with them. So overnight, we suddenly, and it's a small community, the overall investor community sitting in yeah. Bombay and Bangalore is a very small yeah. co investor community. And what it did was they carry the good news with them because everybody likes to tell war stories, especially the investor groups. And they like to tell war stories of their successes. Nobody talks about their failures, but everybody loves to talk about their successes. So give them a success, you'll be doing yourselves a favor and the country a favor because more investment money will come in. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, William, before I open it to the audience, what, you know, you've been redefining Fab India and we've been loving Fab India and I can, I mean, at least for me, I can say after my age of 23 till my age of 50, I will love Fab India, <laughs> is uh, what more can we expect from Fab India? What else is happening? You know, briefly, as I said, we are not going to be an e-commerce brand. And I think that what we are going to do is focus on the lifestyle space. So from what you eat to what you wear to what you put on your skin, the idea is that for people who believe in the ideology that we believe in, they will find us to be their lifestyle home. So that's the idea. Okay. Uh, so we cannot take any questions because you have to leave. Uh, so, you know, but I wanted to share this with all of you. Today, William has come to talk to, you know, when we told him that they are entrepreneurs coming from all over India. So he has come uh, to meet us. Today is his mother's birthday and he's come flown all the way from Delhi to be with us and to interact. Uh, so we are very, very thankful and, uh, uh, and it you. means a lot to us that uh, uh, you have come. And uh, so the, net, the five people who've not gone to Fab India should go. And maybe you should yeah. do a quick pitch about the new thing that you have, the cards that you have in Fab India now. <laughs> so, um, or the Fab Cafe, some of the cool things that you're doing actually, now. Actually, no, I mean, I'm speaking to a room full of customers. And I just thank you for your business. And I really wish you all the best. I mean, really, being an entrepreneur is an amazing thing. We're all born entrepreneurs. I remember when I was a kid, my friends and I would play with aeroplanes. My friends would want to become pilots. I would want to own an airline. And I realized, I told my dad one day, there must be something wrong with me because all my friends want to become pilots and I want to run the airline. I have no desire. <laughs> so he said, my dad said to me, he said, you know, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, you know, good luck to you guys. Good luck with your mission because I think it's really amazing to be in a room. I can sense the energy right now. <laughs> And it's really amazing Thank to be here. So Thank much, you so much, William. We love your energy and we love Fab India. Thank you so much.